So welcome back. Um, we will now move to the next talk uh, by Farhan and Vikram about applying configuration diffing for production safety. Hi everyone, thank you for coming to the last batch of talks. Uh, my name is Farhan, I'm a senior or staff developer now at Google. Uh, I'm Vikram, I'm uh, the technical lead for config safety in Google. And today we're gonna to be talking about configuration diffing. It's a novel practice at Google grew up organically and I'm hoping to introduce you to it. So in this section, I'm hoping to explain to you why this is even a problem that we want to solve and why configuration at Google requires this novel solution. So number one, uh, as everyone has heard so far in the discussions we've had with Marcel and Marcos and everybody else, Google's primary configuration language is Turing complete and declarative with very complicated control flow and very unique reference resolution. So it's often difficult for developers to do a two-person review where you're looking at someone else's code change and trying to understand what the outcome of that will be. Number two is a similar issue. GCL code is difficult and sophisticated. So uh, those intermediate developers that Marco spoke about, they tend to write abstractions and systems that more um, casual developers use to actually do the configuration. So let's say I have a, uh, I'm a sophisticated developer in GCL. I'll build a framework for my team that allows them to take a set of runtime parameters, a set of scaling parameters, a job type, and mix all those together. And I create the abstractions for them to be able to do that so that they can mix and match and create their custom deployment. But those abstractions are often leaky, especially because of the semantics of the language. So we often find that those abstractions tend to break when developers actually practice them. That leads to more problems. And last but not least, and as we've discussed as well here, uh, even though there's a significant amount of configuration code, we don't have a robust testing culture. And so we lack a lot of the standard solutions that other languages provide. So those are not the only problems we have with configuration, but those are the problems in the scope of the solution I'm hoping to present. Um, the solution we have designed is called configuration reports. It's multifaceted and Victor will explain more about the characteristics of the solution, which make it a good solution. But the characteristics I'd like to speak about are that it's fast. The reports are often ready before the reviewer is available, and we tend to present these at the code review stage of a developer workflow. They're ubiquitous. They're universally available without the user having to provide any input. They're structured. We render the reports with the knowledge of the output format and can offer inline feedback about the data types, encoding, and more. They're authoritative. We aim to remove any false positives and our users can definitely rely on our reports. They're not second-guessing the output that we provide. And last but not least, they're very easy to use. We find that people want to use our reports. The problems I mentioned just a second ago, I'd like to explain how config reports actually resolves those issues. So for number one, uh, the fact that it's a Turing complete declarative language with odd resolution rules, uh, we bypass all of the complicated semantics by presenting to the user what the compiled output is instead of showing them what the source code is. That way, the user doesn't have to understand or do the mental gymnastics required to understand what the change is actually gonna manifest as. And that also applies to number two. We don't need to deal with the user abstractions. We don't need to deal with the frameworks that those sophisticated developers have set up. The code reviewer and the author can actually just look at the report and boil it down to the data structure of the uh, underlying production system that they are familiar with. In Google's case, uh, this solution that I'm presenting compiles down to the Borg service proto, which most developers know and is fairly easy to understand. Uh, lastly, because config reports are available automatically for every single change, and we do offer some customization to users, the lack of unit testing doesn't bother us as much. We would still like to have a testing culture at Google, but its absence doesn't ne negatively affect this solution. Right. Thank you, Farhan. 
So uh, Farhan uh, went over like what problem we are trying to solve uh, and uh, our solution uh, to the problem. Uh, I want to like provide like a very high level view of how uh, the uh, config diffing works. Uh, and also go over like some of the impact metrics uh, that we are collected with config diffing. Um, so at a very high level, configuration diffing inside Google, um, irrespective of the uh, type of configuration, can be broken into uh, three pieces, right? So the first piece is the dependency management. This is very important uh, uh, in Google-like uh, environment. Uh, because uh, we have like a single uh, source repository of all code and config. Uh, and given the language like uh, GCL where there is a, a tree of uh, like import dependencies even between uh, the files, uh, as part of uh, any change, you could be editing any file in the tree. Uh, right, so the first step is uh, figuring out even what are the leaf configurations uh, that are affected by your change, right? So uh, first we do a dependency analysis uh, step to say, all right, you, you change uh, file A, uh, that basically is now affecting configs uh, one, two, three kind of thing, uh, right? Um, and the uh, second piece uh, of the uh, configuration diffing solution is the uh, execution engine. So once you have this um, uh, collection of leaf config uh, files, uh, we can then evaluate it depending on the uh, type of uh, the subtype of the configuration. So uh, this lends itself well for like uh, like parallel uh, execution, uh, like over distributed systems. That's what we have. We have like. Um, a multi-tenant like evaluation system that depending on the configuration type uh, can evaluate uh, the configuration, um, the final value of the configuration. In, in Google's case, it's, it's essentially a, a proto, uh, protocol buffer, right? Uh, and the third piece is uh, uh, presenting it to the user, which is also very important. Uh, as Farhan mentioned and showed, uh, we have the config report system. Uh, which uh, gets triggered uh, automatically whenever uh, a user is uh, presenting a change uh, for review. Uh, and also we, uh, we provide the report as a diff between uh, the old state and the new state so that it's easier for the user to, or the developer to understand what exactly they are changing. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we also provide some uh, more um, uh, like uh, uh, convenience uh, features, like uh, if your change is actually affecting, uh, let's say, uh, even hundreds of leaf uh, configurations, as long as those configuration diffs are similar, we group them together so that uh, uh, the de developers know, okay, uh, they don't have to go through 100 diffs just by looking at one representative diff and then saying, oh, okay, all of them fall in the same bucket, they can be sure that uh, the other 99 also follow the same pattern, right? So, uh, so this is from, uh, just from the tooling perspective. Uh, from the developer uh, workflow perspective, uh, this is uh, the, like the high-level user journey uh, that the developers go through. Uh, so whenever you create a change uh, in your configuration, uh, you uh, uh, create a, a change list. Uh, with the uh, changes, um, and the configuration report is automatically generated, which is uh, very important to note. Like they don't have to do anything manual to generate this uh, report every time. So a config report is available as soon as they present uh, the change. Uh, and at this point, there is an opportunity for the developers to go. Uh, depending on what they see, it, they, they might be affecting configs they didn't expect to change, or uh, the config itself might be changing in an unexpected way. So uh, they can go back and edit it, and then they come back to stage two, and uh, then they present the uh, change to a second reviewer who, who can then provide like uh, inline comments uh, uh, about similar issues, whether, whether they, they are seeing unexpected changes in the config. And when everything's fine, uh, the config gets submitted and that gets deployed automatically pushed to 
our uh, production systems based on like the Google best practices for uh, production systems. Uh, so the last part of uh, this talk is just going over the impact of config diffing. Um, the first is an anecdote. It was uh, written by uh, Keith, uh, by Keith, who's a developer, who said, um, I often express a config report as the single most effective tool. Uh, we have to help to manage the complexity of running thousands of uh, services. Um, in terms of uh, numbers, uh, we have the config diffing reports available uh, to like 96% of all config changes at Google. Uh, the 4% are more to do with uh, uh, teams having their own weird config system that we don't support. Um, and 67% of uh, these reports um, contain diffs, uh, which means the majority of them have an intention to change uh, something in production. Uh, the others are a combination of uh, just refactoring or cleaning up stuff that doesn't uh, affect the actual output, the final output. Um, something interesting to note as of now we see like of the reports that contain diffs, 21% of them uh, are viewed, or only 21% of them are viewed. Uh, in contrast, we do see that 65% of the reports are viewed if uh, we have flagged an error as part of the uh, diff generation process. Uh, this is something we are taking into account to see how we can add more automation to uh, raise the warning level uh, beyond just build errors, right? Depending on the domain, are there more analysis that we can use to uh, make the users look more closely at the diff reports, right? So that's something we want to do in the future. Uh, we also support like custom workflows, like uh, saying, oh, for this directory, any diff should be blocked unless it's closely reviewed and things like that. Those are like uh, very important, but not uh, significant as of yet. So. Um, you want to yeah. take a week? Yeah. The last uh, part of this, I wanted to talk about if you wanted to implement the solution for yourself. Here is some of the guidance that we'd like to offer. So first, our solution started as a command line app. I, I believe it's at least 10 years old now. And the initial ask was, I've got this change, uh, and I want to know how it'll manifest. Can you evaluate both left-hand side, right-hand side, and give me a diff? And then we had, um, back then we had maybe like under 100,000 configuration files. Now we have many orders of magnitude more than that. So uh, the next feature that was asked was, can you evaluate the dependencies for me? And so then the, the evaluation scaled. Then we asked, we were asked for a UI. And then we were asked for that aggregation feature that Vikram mentioned. And I guess the point of that is don't start at the end where we are. You can start small, offer the command line application, and then build on top of that as you start to see success. Uh, for number two, um, you should make the uh, config reports and configuration diffing a part of your developer workflow. One of the most critical features we've had recently is we've tried to embed everything we do into the canonical tool set. And if it's outside the tool set, the numbers that Vikram presented would be even lower. People don't want to leave their existing tool sets, tool bases, the tool, tools that they use, and go to an external source. They want that in their uh, existing workflow. So may, maintain that. Uh, lastly, the dependency management uh, works well at Google because of our mono repo. If you have a distributed code base using multiple Git repositories, you have very tight controls on uh, source code, this might not be the best solution, but you can still apply some of these practices if you were, if you were to convince everyone to keep their configuration centralized. You, you obviously wouldn't want secrets in there that should be independent of configuration, but bring your source code together and enable this feature set. That's all. Thank you. We can take questions now or wait till the end. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for questions. Yeah, completely. Yes. 
Yeah, so if you have um, a, a lot of uh, similar diffs, you already mentioned you grouped them, but is there any way, how would you represent that to the, to the user, right? Because it might still be relevant which, you know, where all these differences occur, even if they're similar, so it's sort of a matrix, is there a particular representation or is that? This? Uh, I mean, I, uh, so we, we do present the uh, diffs for all of them. Uh, I mean, the basic algorithm is to just look at the hash of the diff and if, if it is the same, uh, group it together. Uh, after probably munging certain uh, fields, which depending on the config, let's say for a bar config, um, a cell name is probably uh, not important, right? We, we, we want to still uh, uh, group the uh, diff together even though the data center uh, location is uh, different, uh, right? Uh, so uh, we do provide the full list of all the configurations that are changed uh, that you can go through, uh, each one of them if you want, but um, provide like the sample uh, of the diff uh, that you can see uh, yeah, so. I'd like to append that. So we have, if I recall, there's at least two or three different systems using a similar algorithm for grouping their uh, diffs. And they use different units of uh, aggregation. One aggregates by job. The other one aggregates by file. So we have the option to present it either way. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? So I, I'm missing some details, I think, here. Or maybe we have a different mental model. So if I'm changing a line in a configuration, I change some configuration value. What is the, the diff that you're creating? Is that through some sort of impact analysis you're doing? Uh, that you're saying, I, if I change this value from 4 to 6, let's say, uh, that affects the, the code that, that is being executed? Is that sort of? No. So can you ex expand on that a little bit? Uh, so, uh, so given a language like GCL, yeah. uh, right? So. I'm trying to base it on what we have seen so far. Mm, um, there could be other computed fields that are dependent on, so just a source code diff is not sufficient. Right? I, I, and of course you can have lambdas and all, all sorts of things. So a source code diff doesn't uh, provide like a f uh, idea of what is the final impact. Right? So, you have this so this stays within the GCL. So if you change some value, then you have some computer fields that are changing, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and like there, there could be also a lot of different uh, leaf configurations that are using uh, a common template. Gotcha, right? okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, maybe one additional uh, clarification, if you compare it to Q or some of the other languages that were shown here, is like, what if you expand everything to JSON fully? and then compare the JSON before and after. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Marcus, actually, yeah, I wanted to... <coughs> uh, Marcus previously mentioned about GCL that the final goal is to compile everything to proto, proto messages, and that's actually what will be displayed. Any other question? If not, I have one. Uh, so, you know, it's, from a very, very far away, it's a bit like if you were comparing the diff of the result of the completion of a language, like the assembly. Of course, assembly cannot be read. Uh, JSON can, so I guess it's much more readable. Still, I guess the idea of having high-level languages is that a small change can actually compute to a big change. So does it happen that uh, the diff in the source code is very small, but the thing to review is very big, and if yes, what can you do about it? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we have the metrics for that, so I would just say it based on, like, gut feel. <laughs> I'll give an anecdote. Marcos frequently makes changes that affect 700,000 mm -hmm. files. Yeah, I, I think that is number of files, but right. each diff itself usually is small. Uh, right, and then we have like just like code diffs, we have collapsible uh, areas where we collapse things that are similar in the file and then show only the uh, diff part, right? Uh, just anecdotally, like we see in each file or each uh, final config, the diffs are usually small, uh, right? But the number of uh, files might be uh, large. A better mental model than comparing the assembly language would be you ran all those programs and capture the standard output of those, of mm. those programs. 
and then that's what we're defing. <coughs> Makes sense. Yes. So I, I had a question about the the way you cluster the diffs. So imagine that you had a foo.java file, which was renamed into a bar.java, and uh, that file was referenced across different configuration file types, uh, a JSON, a GCL, something else. Uh, would those changes be clustered because they're basically foo being renamed in bar, or would you keep them apart because they're concerning different configuration languages and types? So <coughs> I'm trying to do the math in my head, but <laughs> I think in that case, you would only get the diff on the foo file. You wouldn't get the diff on the derivatives or the children that are dependent on it. No, I think, so we have to, like because three different no uh, diffing tools depending on certain parameters, like whether, uh, they, we have certain uh, uh, systems where the config file itself is generated by build step where a different tool actually uh, picks up the change to generate the diff report. Current, I think it's an implementation issue that currently we have it um, as three different reports actually with their own bucketing. Uh, but our ideal vision would be to do bucketing across these tools and stuff like that. But I, I, we are not there. Hi. Uh, on one of the slides, you mentioned that only 20% of the diffs are being viewed by developers. Do you know why that's happening? Uh, at least from the student <laughs> perspective, I really like to rely on them to say, oh, well, this is what my teammates have been working on, and now I know what to work on next. Uh, is it a lot different in like the dev world? <laughs> we have guesses as to why um, developers and reviewers aren't checking the output of configuration. Perhaps they think the changes are trivial. Um, perhaps they are the sophisticated developers that don't need the report to understand how the change will manifest. Um, or perhaps it's just extra friction in their workflow that they're not willing to pay the cost of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this is something we want to improve in the future, but I think it will be based on some more automated like analysis or linters even kind of saying raising the warning level that it can be even something very generic, right? It can even say, oh, the diffs don't look like the code diff, right? The diff on the final input output doesn't look like a code diff. This is something you should probably uh, look into. Because many of the cases, it might be almost a one-to-one -one mapping sometimes. You just change a string, and then the output is change string. They don't care. Um, yeah. Uh, I just want to clarify. It's not saying that, it, I don't think they're saying that the people aren't viewing the, the, the change in the pull request. Right, it's just that, like, the safety measure of the config report, the people aren't looking at that. Yeah. So maybe to clarify, is, is there a summary that they see before they have to click into the report? Where yes. they, yeah. yeah, so that might be a reason why they don't click, right? This yeah. is just to, yeah. Thank you. Any other question? We still have a bit of time. Not really. <laughs> right, if not.